ways that um, having seen um, literature since and talks here were not the usual way of doing things. So, um, but it works out to be accurate and quite fast and trains the usual set of uh, computational problems for a different set of computational problems. <laughs> so um, hopefully that will be of some interest. So I, on the title page, I call this precision image domain deconvolution. So what is precision imaging? Um, I consider it to be using the full direction-dependent, polarization-dependent, essentially everything-dependent um, beam model for your gridding or degridding. So um, anytime you're going between the visibilities and the image plane. And um, a projection is a very good example of this. And, uh, but it's not the only way that you can do that. So <clears throat> to simplify the A projection algorithm and write it in, unfortunately, slightly different terminology, but uh, uh, the top terminology that I'm more familiar with, <clears throat> what A projection is doing in my interpretation of it is on each iteration, you're fitting the sources in the image domain. And from, from the components that you have fit, you generate precise model visibilities. Um, you subtract those model visibilities from the actual data in the visibility plane, and then uh, regrid the residuals. And the regridding can be done faster than the, uh, than the uh, precise modeling, but uh, that's a more of a less the point for this talk. So the, ba the basic thing is that in, um, here's, your, here's your data. Here is your uh, image model. For a, uh, for a transform, summing over all of the components. This B that I have here is a full matrix that is simply um, a number of visibilities by number of image pixels matrix. So um, directly transforms uh, the, uh, the UV gridded image into a into visibilities, and in this I'm using a slightly different assumption in that the actual sky model is has been gridded in the UV plane rather than um, um, analytic. So I'll get to a little bit more of what that means later. If you rewrite the math. And just rewriting the math for now and ignoring some of the other implications, so shifting where you're doing the subtraction, you get what um, has been called software holography or forward modeling. So this is exactly the same thing, except you have shifted. So assuming, so if you're ignoring reality and just going with the math here, um, these two are just a choice of whether you are subtracting and then multiplying effectively or multiplying and then subtracting. Um, the advantage with this is that you only have to actually grid the, uh, the data visibilities once. However, you still have to uh, degrid and grid the uh, model components. So you don't have a um, you don't have any extra efficiency there. And in fact, because you're doing this you actually are restricted to using the same uh, beam model for gridding and degridding. So you're, in principle, going to be a little uh, slower than using a projection. Um, but you've, you don't actually have to keep around the, uh, the data visibilities in their full form. What uh, I call fast holographic deconvolution is taking this uh, one step further and noting that this um, uh, degrading uh, de and gridding step is actually performing exactly the same operations on the sky model um, every iteration. So this matrix that's transforming from your um, gridded uh, model and then this matrix, which is taking your visibility and making a new dirty gridded model, you can combine, you can just do the basic matrix multiplication.
representation of the two and form what I'm calling here H. And the nice thing is that is only have to compute it once. Um, and in principle, this H would be a vastly huge matrix because um, you're transforming from the image, back, uh, image domain back to the image domain. So in principle, if you have, say, a um, thousand by a thousand image, H is going to be a million by a million, and it's complex. So this is not something that, in principle, you can store. However, um, but because you because all it is is um, B, which is multiplied by B, it does have all of the direction-dependent effects, um, polarization. Uh, if you have different, uh, if you have non-uniform um, antennas, you can include that in there as well. Uh, if the antenna pattern is changing over time, you can include that. But essentially, anything that you can include in these Bs, you can include here in this H. Um, what saves it is that it is a very sparse matrix, uh, limited by the actual physical aperture of your array, uh, of your antenna. And <clears throat> this is a <coughs> series of illustrations of what H is doing to your UV printed image. So this is up above is what is the input um, UV simulation image for a series of sources progressively further and further off axis. Um, keep in mind throughout this that I'm used to dealing with the MWA, which has a um, 40 degree wide field of view. So some of the scales of things that I'm going to list are, are going to be a little different. But uh, everything can scale up or down according to the instrument. So if you have a source that's directly on center, well, the uh, DFT of that is uniform everywhere. So this doesn't look like much. As you go progressively off axis, you get a nice ripple, um, which gets finer and finer. When you um, run this through the mapping function, then you can see the uh, pattern from the uh, baseline distribution. And uh, you notice that the, the, the weighting is much higher here, where, the, uh, where there are many overlapping visibilities. And that's uh, an important feature of that. And uh, you can see. As the source gets progressively further and further off axis, you get more and more distortions in uh, the reconstruction of the ripple. Um, if you have, uh, and down below is the uh, Fourier transform of this. So this is you know, the um, dirty image of the model source, which you are then subtracting off of your um, gridded dirty image of your data. And as you can see, and note that it is uh, multiplied by your, um, this is weighted by your primary beam squared here. So uh, as the source moves further and further off axis, um, the relative amplitude is decreasing rapidly. So by the time here it's uh, 20 degrees off axis and close to the first null of the MWA, the amplitude here is 1 50th uh, of what it was in the center. And you have an awful lot of mess here in the center. Um, and if you've done, if you've chosen your uh, your actual image correctly uh, to be large enough, then that mess is is real. I mean, that's what you're going to see in your dirty image. And they should, if you've chosen all the parameters correctly, then it will subtract off nicely. Um, I'm going to go through uh, the details of how I actually go through and implement this at a little bit more of a basic level than is really needed, but just to emphasize a few of the slight differences from the usual way. So you have to start off by calculating your mapping function. And this is a fairly computationally expensive step, but you do only have to do it once. Uh, and the way you, that you calculate it, you, have, you get the first gridding of your visibility data for free. So that's nice, but that's a small thing. Um, need to, uh, this is in the UV plane, so you have to take an FFT to get to the actual 
image domain. Um, if you're doing long integrations, W projection is uh, very difficult with this, and I'll get to why. So I believe what I have been exploring for long integrations is instead converting to the field fix pixel format in order to um, build up long integrations and account for wide field effects properly. Uh, for snapshots, you don't have to do that. Um, convert the instrumental polarization images into Stokes. Um, calculate the components from the Stokes images and uh, build a new UV model. That's the um, this up here, so which becomes then a sum of all of these. And I'm here just showing the real part of the model. Um, apply the mapping function to that full model and <clears throat> subtract in the UV, uh, UV domain uh, this dirty model from your gridded visibilities and uh, rinse repeat. So it's very similar to the standard implementation. To actually build the mapping function is um, somewhat complicated, but I will run through it rather quickly. Just a few things to highlight. In order to get, uh, avoid severe aliasing effects, you do have to have an image that is defined to be much larger than the actual field of view that you are uh, actually interested in the involving sources in. With the MWA and our large field of view, I essentially end up making an image the size of the entire sky. Um, uh, it needs to be at least twice as large as the field of view that you are looking at, and I typically use uh, larger than that. That is a cost on your FFT. Um, you have to start out with a defined beam model. So if you decide uh, during deconvolution, say if you're doing healing or something like that, where you're actually updating your calibration or updating the beam model you're using, every time that gets updated, you have to regenerate the entire mapping function. That's a cost. Um, <clears throat> start, it's important to in the UV plane, define precisely what your physical extent that it's possible for an antenna to have uh, received uh, information from. Because the, uh, with, then the very next step is for every visibility, uh, calculate every pixel in the image that you have defined that will ever contribute to that visibility or that the visibility would get gridded back down to. Um, skipping through a bit more, the, you take that set of pixels that can contribute to a visibility and uh, group all of the visibilities that use the same set of pixels. So if you have a very fine time resolution, this could be um, you know, several, um, several time elements uh, in succession, um, especially for short baselines, and uh, calculate your B model for each one of those, and essentially do the matrix multiplication of the, those uh, B models with themselves to do the what I had as a B times B, a Fermation transpose of B times B, really. Um, so, and that is one small subset of the mapping function. Build that up for every uh, set of pixels, and at the very end, go back and look for any uh, duplicates, you know, any um, sets of pixels that have been mapped in the same way multiple times. Select those together um, and convert the entire mess into a convenient uh, storage format where you actually uh, don't need additional information in order to um, extract the data uh, and convert it to some format. I use the, a format similar to uh, the basic sparse storage format for large matrices from numerical recipes in C so that you can do um, sparse matrix multiplication efficiently. So why do you do this? Um, this is a very rough 
estimate of the computational costs involved in the different algorithms. Um, so this is the total number of components that you're going to deep involve. Um, number of visibilities and the number of pixels in your grid kernel. Um, so, and so a typical a transpose approach is going to scale as the number of visibilities that you have times the uh, number of pixels that are in the, in the convolution function and times the total number of components. I'm neglecting here the effect of, say, fitting multiple components at once because that has the same effect on all, all of these. Um, in, the image in the image domain deconvolution, such as software holography, um, you have at least a factor of two worse for that because you have to uh, use the same uh, precision for gridding and degrading. There's other factors in front of both of these. This, this is just for order of magnitude comparison. With uh, FHD, the main difference is that during, um, there is no there is uh, no factor of number of components times the number of visibilities because that has all been pre-computed here. And, however, um, the size of the mapping function scales as the um, dimension of your, uh, as the number of pixels in your grid kernel squared instead of linearly. And so the more complicated a grid kernel you have, as in the larger it is, it can be as complicated as you like if it's compact. But if it's very extended in the UV plane, um, then this is going to start dominating here. But the main advantage is that when you are actually, uh, when you have a, a much larger number of uh, visibilities than uh, the number of pixels that actually contain data in your UV plane image, or uh, the uh, number of uh, grid kernel pixels, then um, this will, um, then this is essential, then the actual number, the, the time during deconvolution is relatively negligible. Um, so there are several advantages and limitations of FHD. Start with the advantages. Um, it's very useful if you have compact array layouts. And this is just that if your array is relatively compact, with, say, a large number of baselines, pushed in together, then you have a lot more redundancy in your mapping function. Um, you, have, you have more overlapping cap coverage. Redundancy is not really the right word. It's that um, <clears throat> many more visibilities will have been stacked up for the same elements of the mapping function. So as you go to larger numbers of antennas, uh, the mapping function does not inherently get any larger. Um, that's because the actual physical size of it scales as your UV coverage. Now, typically, if you add more antennas, your UV coverage is going to increase as well. But typically, um, as you add more antennas, the um, many more of those visibilities actually overlap in the pixels that they'll get, get gridded to. And so it will not typically scale up at, uh, according to the total number of visibilities that you have. Um, I put here that it's very useful for well-characterized instruments. That's because um, if you are going to likely need to change your beam model or calibration during deconvolution, you take a big hit in that you have to recalculate the mapping function every time. Whereas if you have a well-characterized instrument and you know and you really know what your model is, then you can use it once or maybe update it just a couple times. Any time, and it's also useful if you have any time with many of these over overlapping visibilities. So as I said, high time resolution. Also, if you're doing continuum in imaging with um, visibilities that actually have high frequency, but you're um, making one large bandwidth image, that will also lead to uh, many uh, overlapping visibilities and a more efficient mapping function. 
It's also good for, um, this is a point I've added on after listening to some of the talks today, that's relatively good for um, systems that are limited by um, I.O. bandwidth. Because you build up the mapping function, and it, you can, it can just sit there in memory. And all that is actually being written in and out is an image, which is much, much smaller than your visibilities. So you don't, you don't actually have to transfer it back and forth. It has significant, yes? Two minutes. Two minutes. I'm being too slow. <laughs> or on the significant disadvantages. If these things change, um, you have to recalculate it. You also have to make your image uh, much larger than your field of view. Um, and similarly, if you do not have very much memory in your system, then you can't store, a, uh, then you might not be able to actually store the mapping function. Um, run through a couple of quick demonstration images of this uh, using data from the MWA. This is a picture of it. Um, um, this is the uh, aerial image of the full 128 tile MWA currently being um, fully constructed and being uh, commissioned out in Australia. So this, is, however, is data from the 32 tile uh, engineering prototype. So this is a um, five-minute snapshot covering over 1,000 square degrees centered on picture A, a very bright source. Um, the image looks rather terrible. Uh, this is the dirty image, so before any de deconvolution. Um, after deconvolution, all of the um, artifacts from, from picture A disappear, and this background is actually uh, about, is very smooth. So um, the for detecting in, uh, source components, the noise floor is about 10 times lower than the ripple that you see here. Also, I've saturated the, um, the color scale so that picture A is um, really 400, 400 Janskys at these uh, wavelengths. Just to show some of the sources that are detected in that image, um, the residual image in which you can see streaks here but those are from the Crab Nebula, 67 degrees out of the field of view, and I did not attempt to deconvolve it. Um, and the um, polarized residual image, in which you can see the <coughs> streaks from the Crab Nebula much greater, and uh, still no artifact from uh, picture A, which in deconvolution, I was fitting it purely in Stokes' eye, so it was not fit in order to uh, make the uh, polarization go away. I won't say much about the Helix mosaic thing because I'm essentially out of time, but um, that is our approach for um, long integrations, number of demonstration images put through in Helix. There is an awful lot of work that needs to be done with this um, because the development of this uh, uh, consists of myself with, uh, with oversight. Um, so there's not, much, there's not much support in coding going on. But um, there are many effects that still need to be properly included into it. Um, one interesting thing that we, are, uh, that we are also working on is uh, integrating automatic generation of 3D power spectrum with this. Um, this our primary interest is uh, EOR targeted observations. So we're looking at um, diffuse emissions from the Black Plain and doing a southern sky survey. So, in conclusion, um, at least in the tests that we have done with our MWA data, FHD can uh, achieve the same precision as visibility data domain subtraction deconvolution. But the um, exact computational trade-off between different algorithms is not really clear for our current instruments. Um, but as we go to larger and larger arrays, um, it looks as though uh, that cost will become more favorable towards FHD um, bec because you will, um, because the visibilities will have much more overlapping coverage as you have more baselines, and <clears throat> you do far more computations on the one mapping function than the actual input and output that you need to send to uh, send to memory because 
you're only sending the images, and you can leave the massive mapping function in memory if you have the memory for that. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, so it is the same. It is indeed the same mapping function. Um, it, you can it. You can have the the visibilities can be from um, they they could be from completely different antenna types. So uh, ideally, they would have the. I mean, I don't think you could mix like circular polarized antennas and linear polarized antennas. That would be madness. But um, the actual and the actual physical antennas could have a very different beam shape. Could have it could be varying over time, um, and that may be something to talk more about um, outside of this talk. But essentially, the <clears throat> regardless of what the sky model actually looks like, that is measured into visibilities in the same in the same fashion and it's uh, gridded back in the in the same fashion regardless of what the sky looks like and so um, if you uh, model this one image of the sky through just one visibility and regridded it and then took another and took the that model of the sky and uh, sampled it into a different visibility, say that it happened to overlap, and regridded that. Well, if you were adding those images after the fact, you may as well add that inside the, combine that addition inside the mapping function. Yeah. So, if you want to do some self count, you would, you'd have to update the mapping function every cycle. You, if you so, if you wanted to do something like self cal, um, you would probably want to use something else, at least for the first few iterations. And um, you might be willing to sacrifice regenerating the mapping function once or a couple times during deconvolution to update that. But you would not want to update it every time because, uh, in my experience. Building the mapping function and gridding uh, and gridding the visibility data once is about ten times as long as um, um, gridding and degridding just without it. So uh, you really would not want to do it more than one in ten times, and then you would not be getting in any any advantage. The, the, the mapping function doesn't know about <laughs> any antenna gain errors. The only thing it knows about it is the visibility data. So if you go do a self you keep the same mapping function. And you just have to transform the visible the your oh phase yes phase corrector visible right data. so you, yeah for that that's right you would you would need to but you would need to regrid the data yeah that's right but that's, that's, that's okay you need yeah, to do that right. anyway. the, the mapping function does not know about conversion no. errors that's right no. so sorry I was answering the wrong question okay, so you you could do it that way if you wanted I yes. guess but you wouldn't naturally do it that way right so yeah I could have the scaling loss for the various something on n components. Uh, it should really should be the number of iterations, number of iterations. And here I was uh, assuming because they essentially scale all the same with number of components. I was just assuming that you were doing one uh, component per iteration. But uh, in my work, I don't do that, and I know you don't do that either. So it should be a number of iterations. I mean, if I give you a uh, ballpark figures like. There are 10 to 10 visibilities and 10,000 or 10,000 pixel image. Uh, what would be the storage of the uh, So I can give you an estimate based on, in my experience with MWA data, the mapping function is um, with approximately the same size as the visibility data. Um, perhaps um, 
if the visibility data has been averaged down, it will be rather larger, but um, within, a, within an order of magnitude of the size of the visibility data that went into it. That's a ballpark figure based on what I've used. It's pretty big. <laughs> yeah. It is. Yeah. But you don't have to store the visibility data alongside it. It's still large, though. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>